Oh, hey. Didn't see you there. It's me, Damien Clements, and I'm here to talk to you about the first Nazi German company I get to talk to you about. Alright, so that is Mercedes-Benz slash Daimler-Benz. Either way works, they, they, like, they were a merger of two companies, and that's why they have two names. So Hold on there, buddy. What you just said was really dumb. So they don't have two different company names. Uh, Mercedes-Benz is what Daimler-Benz called the type of cars they made. So that's pretty cool. So they were founded in 1924, like I said, with the merger of two companies. And um, they're most famous for their Mercedes-Benz 770, which you will see a lot of famous dictators walking around in, such like um, Hermann Göring, Hitler, Benito Mussolini, and even the Emperor of Japan. I, why does he have a German car? <laughs> so, um, besides the uh, Hitler wagon they made, they also made um, tanks, uh, engines for tanks, cars, planes. They made a lot of engines. They also made uh, rifle barrels for the uh, Gevar 98. And if you may be asking yourself, um, how did they get the people to make these? Well, that was about uh, 60,000 Jewish slaves. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you go to their website today, they'll say, Oh, well, we needed uh, to use slave labor from the camps because we couldn't get any workers. They were all in the army. But they neglect to mention they don't have to pay slaves, and that big reason they use slaves. So uh, you can take that as you will. But, and um, now that we talk about what they did, it's time to talk about what they do now. Which, funnily enough, they still make cars. And besides making cars, I'm gonna transition because I I don't have a script for that part yet. Two thousand years later. All right, my German class, it's time to talk about the history of Daimler-Benz up until today. So after World War II, they did admit it, their links to the Nazi government, and they did um, you know say sorry for you know having sixty thousand Jewish slaves and whatnot, and they've also since then supported different charities that help displaced people, people that were, have been displaced by war, kind of like to apologize and whatnot, which it is what it is, but anyway, so they kept making cars up until the 90s when they were bought by Chrysler, and I shouldn't say they were bought by Chrysler, their, their car division, uh, like the part of that company that made cars was bought by Chrysler, and it didn't last very long, they didn't get along apparently, so in 2007, the uh, Daimler-Benz car division split off of Chrysler, and now it's its own company, but also separate from the parts of Daimler-Benz that weren't originally cars, so there's two different Daimler-Benzes. Anyway, so they still make, so right now in the year 2020, Daimler-Benz makes the type of car that is called Mercedes-Benz. Alright? Okay. So, you know, it's now time to talk about the next German company, which I'm really excited about. I'm so excited, I don't even know what that company's gonna be yet. Let's go! Three days later. Alright dudes, it's me, Damien here, back at it again with another Nazi German company. Are you ready? Because I am. Alright, so today I'll be talking about the Nazi German company known as Krupp. And Krupp... They were, they made a lot of steel, and they did iron, and they've existed since the 1800s. So, at the time I'll be talking about, the company was run by a man by the name of Gustav Krupp von Bolten und Halbach, who has the lovely distinction of being the only Nazi war criminal to be tried for war crimes in both World War I and World War II. Isn't that cool? He was also described by some of his friends as a quote-unquote super Nazi. So, the, at the time during World War II and World War I, kind of, they made artillery pieces. So, they made this kind of thing. And they also, if you know the big German battleship Bismarck, they made the guns for that. If they're really big guns. So, that was cool. So, now that I've talked about all the cool stuff they made, let's talk about the uncool way they made them. So, uh, at the time, at, the, at its height, I should say, Krupp had about 100,000 slave laborers. Uh, about 25,000 of that was Jewish, the rest were um, uh, Eastern European prisoners of war. Yeah, that's pretty awful. <laughs> so, um, the, like I said, the leader was tried for war crimes after World War II. 
However, he was deemed too senile to go to jail. So he just kept on existing in the wild till 1950 when he died, which is unfortunate. <laughs> so now that I've talked about what they did, I need to talk about how they got to what they do today, which is still industrial equipment and stuff. But then again, I don't have a script for this part yet, so... A few moments later. All right, guys, it's time to talk about Krupp in the modern day. All right, so... Like I said, right after World War II, the owner was tried for war crimes. However, he didn't get sentenced to anything because he had dementia. Well, his son, at the time, helped him run the business, and he got sentenced to uh, 12 years because his son didn't have dementia. And um, so that sentence was eventually reduced, and after he got out of prison, they just gave him back his industrial empire. He, just, he was allowed to keep running Krupp, even though he was a big part of the 100,000 slaves. It's baffling. I. <laughs> Alright, so, it, it would go on in, in the 60s, Krupp would apologize to the uh, Jew, the, the state of Israel, uh, and pay reparations to the survivors that live in the state of Israel. However, the company outright refused to pay for the slave labor that wasn't Jewish. So, all the prisoners of war and all the refugees they used as slave labor that weren't Jewish, they just, they don't get anything. Which is another baffling thing. And another baffling thing is just, it still exists today and people still do business with them. It's, it's insane. I, well, I, this, I, there's not, not much else I can talk about with Krupp. That's just awful. It's awful. And, um, we'll just move on to the next in company, I guess. Uh. Alright guys, I'm gonna make this as short as possible because this is getting kind of long, lengthy, and I didn't intend for this to be as lengthy, you know? Alright, so, of course, this last company is gonna be the company that started it all, Hugo Boss. The same company that makes these glasses frames that I personally own. So, uh, Hugo Boss, funnily enough, was founded by a na man with the name Hugo Boss. I know, it was founded in 1922. And uh, he, the founder, Hugo Boss, was an ardent national socialist. He had a picture of Hitler in his apartment, him and Hitler together. And I can imagine there was a heart around it with roses. But, you know, that's conjecture. So, they uh, made SS uniforms. And they made uh, some army uniforms, but mostly SS uniforms. You know, here's an example of an SS uniform, if you didn't know. It's kind of ugly. I'm not a fan. So, um... You know, fitting with the theme of these Nazi characters, they had 140 uh, mostly women slaves that made the uh, SS uniforms. And I mean, I, honestly, I think it's befitting the SS uniforms to be made by slaves, if I'm honest. It just, that just fits. So, after the war, Hugo Boss was branded a war, not a war criminal, he was branded a uh, Nazi supporter. So he wasn't allowed to run the business anymore, and it didn't really matter anyway, because he died in 1948. So, um, yeah, after the war, they just kept, they kept made men's suits, and they make, uh, cologne. And they all, do that all to this day. In 2011, they did apologize for owning slaves and, you know, being supporters of Nazis. However, it was 2011. That is so long ago. Wait, no, hold on. No, wait, stop, guys, wait, hold on. 2011 is far too uh, long after the fact. Like, why did they wait so long to apologize? That's ridiculous. Uh, yeah, but other than that, there's not much else to talk about. Um, if you want to know whether it's uh, like morally right to buy Hugo Boss products to this day, I, wow, there's a really cool guy who's writing a German speech on that subject. He hasn't written it yet, but by the time you're watching this, I hope he has. So stay tuned for that. And make sure to ask him easy questions, because he doesn't speak German. Anyway, see ya.